Welcome to the American Diversity Report podcast, where we interview unusual change makers and diverse innovators. I'm Deborah Levine, the editor of the American Diversity Report and your podcast host. And with me today is Jerry Colonna. He is a leading executive coach who uses the skills he learned as a venture capitalist to help entrepreneurs. He is co-founder and CEO of Reboot, the executive coaching and leadership development company, host of Reboot podcast, and author of Reunion, Leadership and the Longing to Belong and Reboot, Leadership and the Art of Growing Up. <laughs> he draws on his wide variety of experiences to help clients design a more conscious life and make needed changes to their career to improve their performance and satisfaction. He was a partner with JP Morgan Partners, the private equity firm of JP Morgan Chase. And earlier he launched Flatiron Partners, which became one of the most successful early stage investment programs in New York City area. He currently lives on a farm in Colorado. Hmm. And before we talk about his incredible professional career, I have to ask, how did you go from New York City to Colorado? Well, first of all, thank you for having me on the show and thank you for the work you do. It matters in the world. And I really appreciate that. Um, I guess the best contrast would be we can sort of contrast life on a farm in Colorado with life in New York City. But let's contrast it with growing up in the streets of Brooklyn. Because my wife and I uh, have 40 acres and three horses and several cats. And if she had her way, it would include llamas and sheep and cows and chickens and all sorts of things. So I guess the way to understand that transition is how does a kid from Brooklyn end up with horses, especially horses that don't have cops on their back, because that's the only horses I knew as a kid. Um, and I think it's, uh, it, it, in short, it comes down to love. Um, I, in my early 50s, um, came to love the mountains, came to love the outdoors. And then eventually I found the, the, the woman that I fell in love with. And so, yeah, I actually pay the ag fertilizer bill. So that just shocks me every day. <laughs> so that's, that's me. That's, that's the contrast. <laughs> well, I will share with you that I was born in Brooklyn. Oh, I was, but I was brought up in the island of Bermuda. Back in oh. the day, I knew horses as those that uh, tugged carriages along mm. the island roads. Mm. And I know how loving and lovable it can be. So I'm glad you're there. You're, you're, Amazing doing all of that and mm -hmm. still helping others achieve their dreams too. So, uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, to that end, you know, you mentioned my previous career as an investor. And prior to that, I was a journalist and occasionally I was a college profession, professor. Um, but, and I suppose I'm also an author because now that you have two books under your belt, right, then, then it's not just an accident. Um, I am doing the work that I was born to do. I am uh, doing work where I am leaning into the suffering that I experience in the world and looking at the causes and conditions and being a mirrored surface container for people's troubles so that they can make sense of it 
so that not only are they less likely to suffer themselves, but equally or perhaps even more importantly, they are less likely to hurt others. Because when those of us who have power, either by dint of the bodies that power is projected onto, or by economic status, or by role, or all of the above, when we suffer and we don't do what we need to do with it, we hurt other people. So long-winded way of talking about the work I do, but that's what I do. Very inspiring. Indeed. Yeah, I understand too. I I may do that a, a little bit myself. <laughs> I think you might. <laughs> That's right. Um, and we need it more than ever these days. Please. Isn't that the truth? Yeah, it is. It it is unfortunately so. You know, I started writing reunion. Uh, leadership and the longing to belong in the summer of 2020 mm -hmm. after the murder of George Floyd mm -hmm. and after really being challenged by my now 31 year old daughter to not just be performative in my allyship but to put my money where my mouth is to put my shoulder to the wheel she challenged me to be a co-conspirator for systemic belonging, which is a beautiful phrase. Yes. And when I started writing, I remember talking to my editor and say, saying, after my first book, Reboot, did very, very well, continues to sell very well, continues to have an audience. And the basic supposition there is that better humans make better leaders. And it's kind of an obvious statement. And so, because I'm always kind of sarcastic because I'm from Brooklyn, <laughs> I would say, well, if it's so obvious, why do we have such difficult leadership? And we have difficult leadership because the process of being an adult is really hard. So when I started writing this book, I proposed to my editor that I wanted to look at the question of belonging. And she said, effectively, what's a white cisgender straight man like you doing with this question? And I said, if folks who look like me aren't willing to lean into these very complicated and difficult issues, or more specifically, aren't willing to lean into the question of how have I been complicit in and benefited from the conditions in the world I say I don't want to see, then how is anything going to change? Because as you well know, too often the work is left to the people who bear the consequences of our not doing this work collectively. So that was that conversation two and a half, three years ago. And here we are, right, Deborah? A world where we seem to be even more divided, even more at each other's throats, even more in need of empathy, compassion, patience, <laughs> love, and even more in need of seeing the other's story in our own story. Anyway, that's the book. That's me. That's what I'm doing these days. Wow. Well, I'm just delighted to hear from you and about what you're doing like that. It, it's um, a very quickly changing world. You know, yeah. It's very difficult to, to grasp onto it and not have it different by tomorrow morning you know yeah. by tomorrow evening is a different again so it, it, it people are struggling as they always have been in terms of belonging but the struggle to figure out what to do it's just really 
sometimes impossible, I think. Mm. I wake up at three in the morning with some ideas and I tell myself, okay, go back to bed, sleep on it, because <laughs> right. by morning, <laughs> right. you know, it, it, it'll right. have changed. Uh, and the ability to adapt to change, I think, is part of what makes a person successful these days. Would you say so, too? Sure, but I would I would expand it and say the ability to be comfortable with the uncertainty is one of the most important skill sets. And, you know, what comes to mind is a teaching, one of my, my I'm a Buddhist, I took my refuge vows as a Buddhist about 22 years ago. And, um, <clears throat> excuse me, one of my teachers is the American nun, Ani Pema Chodron. And she has a wonderful little book called Comfortable with Uncertainty. And in it, there's a passage in which she talks about how all around us, the world seems to be storming. And that like the world and its constantly changing weather, our inner landscape is often always stormy. And her teaching is for us to sit like a mountain in the midst of a hurricane. Oh, I love it. it. It's a beautiful image. And I think it's especially apt for the world as it is right now. Especially if we start to understand what is the mountain? The mountain is not rigidity. The mountain is not stubbornness. The mountain is a commitment to values. Hmm. The mountain is a commitment to seeing to humanity, even within people with whom we disagree. I'll tell you a quick story. I was in San Francisco two days ago and I got, I was taking Uber back to the airport to fly home to Colorado. And the car drove up and the driver uh, was wearing a turban. He was obviously of the, of the Sikh faith, the Sikh faith. And I got in the car and I said, how's your day going? I said, oh, very good. How's your day going? And I said, I want you to know that I know it's hard. And he sort of did a double take and he looked in the rear view mirror and he looked at me. And through that way, we've made eye contact. And I said, the world is a really challenging place right now. And one thing I know about that faith is the teaching to see no stranger. And so I said, we've got 20 minutes before we go to the airport. I just want you to know that I see you. And we ended up laughing and having a lovely time. And now I have a friend in San Francisco. I mean, I have more than one friend, but another friend another in friend. San Francisco. A um, wonderful story. How, how is that related to what you call the reunion process? Is that about seeing other people? It is. It very much is. You know, when my first book came out, one of the phenomena that I experienced, it was very surprising. I would show up and do book readings and talks, and invariably somebody, regardless of their background, would come up to me and say, because I, I, I wrote very openly and honestly about my struggles as a kid and the family, the adverse conditions that we grew up with, poverty, mental illness. And invariably, somebody would come up to me and say, some form of your story is my story. And most striking of which was a woman named Joy Tende Kangari, whom I met in Ireland. Where? And she'd been born in, Zim in Ireland. In Ireland, okay. And she'd been born in Zimbabwe. Ah. 
And one of the first things she told me was that her father had been killed on Robben Island, which of course is where Nelson Mandela was held. And she explained that her father had been a freedom fighter based in Zimbabwe and had worked towards the end of apartheid and was beaten to death by the police. Now, that fact is what drew her to my story. And nothing could be further from Robben Island than the streets of Brooklyn where I grew up, <laughs> right? But what she was really saying was your sto story of sadness and pain and the wish for love, safety, and belonging is my story. Meaning she too wants love, safety, and belonging. And that's what gave rise to this notion of writing a book about answering the longing to belong and about the need to hear each other's stories so that even for a few minutes when we're sitting in the back of an Uber car, we can see the other person not as a stranger, but as someone who has a heart, who wants to be loved, who wants to feel safe, and ultimately that they want to belong. Being able to hear and see people resonate with them um, is such a gift. And unfortunately, it's being lost these days, certainly during the pandemic, right? And then when so many people, especially young people, are online, it's very difficult for them, right, to absorb these skills and talents and attitude, right? And yet that's exactly what they need in order to, to, to lead, Otherwise, what, what are they going to do, <laughs> you know? And that's what leadership is missing increasingly. I'm so delighted that you're doing what you're doing. Um, and I'm, I'm hoping that, that you'll, you'll be able to assist a lot of these people, especially our young folks, because they need these skills. Well, I'll, I'll say this. I, I, I think broadly speaking, what we struggle with in our society is the cultivation of empathy. Mm -hmm. We get wrapped around the axle trying to do, say, DEI work properly. Yeah. And we lose touch with the underlying first principle, which is to see no stranger as the, the brilliant writer Valerie Kaur wrote in her book, See No Stranger, yeah. Radical Love. We lose sight of our, our ability to respond even to anger and violence with compassion. Yes. And why do we lose that? We lose that because it's, it's hard. If I watch, if I'm walking down the street and, and people who identify as I do are being protested against and their genocide is being called for, how, how do we cultivate compassion in the wake of that? A good question. <laughs> well, but here's the thing. I don't know when you want to start counting the birth of humanity, how many millennia ago it was, but every single wisdom tradition teaches us the same thing, that the way to respond to hate is with love. Change the words, change the context. All of our elders say the same thing. Is, is this why you fold into your work the topic of uh, ancestral history? It is. It's exactly why. 
because I think because because we lose touch, I'll, I'll give you a perfect example. One of my grandmothers emigrated from Italy, from southern Italy, in the early 19th, 18th century, uh, or early 20th century, I'm sorry, yes. as a young teenager. And in writing this book, in reuniting with my own ancestors, I stepped into her body and imagined what must it have been like to be 16, year old, 16 years old on Ellis Island, worried that she might be turned back because she had TB. Ooh. And then from that place, imagine what it would be like to be a 16, 17, 18 year old mother on the southern border of the United States, carrying your baby from Venezuela through Mexico only to be confronted by razor wire in the Rio Grande. See, we have a problem on the southern border. I have no doubt about that. But you and I, we're old enough to know that we've had a problem with immigration reform for 50 years. At least. At least, okay? And so can we re-inject empathy into the debate? Can we say, just like my grandmother, there's a woman who's willing to sacrifice all for her child? And of course, my great-grandparents came through Ellis Island in New York, also from Russia, ah. you know, trying to escape pogroms, pogroms. And, and the beastly killings, mass killings that went on. May uh, their souls be at rest. Thank you. And interestingly enough, when I go back to my ancestors, uh, one of them comes to mind, a banker in New York. Mm -hmm. Investments in banking, right? Early in the 1900s, was the first one to hire African-Americans and women. Mm -hmm. And his colleagues tried to bankrupt him because of it. Mm -hmm. How dare he? Mm -hmm. He dared, and he went further. And I think about that courage and bravery and try and absorb it <laughs> and do the same. It's amazing. What was his name? Uh, his last name was Swig, S-W-I-G. And, and do you know what his first name was? Uh, let's see. Uh, he had uh, 11 or 12 children. I know some of those uh -huh. names. <laughs> well, <laughs> I, 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 I asked so that we could just bring his memory forward. Oh, thank you. Um, it, it's, um, I will, if you don't mind, it's not coming to mind. I, well, we'll find it. We'll find my it. My grandmother's yeah. name. Ida, Swig, mm -hmm. Malloy, right? Who married a young man in the Navy mm -hmm. and they moved to Bermuda mm -hmm. where they, his father had set up shop. Mm -hmm. And his father, right, David Malloy, built the shop on purpose right at the edge of where the white and black communities might meet so that both could go to that store. Mm. So it seems like an entire genetic thing on both sides. And they continue to do that through generations. See, what I'm hearing in your story is those ancestors 
had a big enough heart that they could imagine what those who did not look like them might possibly be experiencing. Oh, yeah. And they lived their lives in the grips of that empathy. Yeah, they did. And it pass, must have passed it along through generations mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. generations. My own daughter is a doctor. And it, it just goes on and on. And looking at your work, you know, dealing with such difficult issues as we, we are now, um, what advice might you have for a young person today who has ambition to be a leader in whatever area they, of expertise they're following? So the process of becoming a leader is stormy. Just like the process of becoming an adult can be stormy. And I go back to the teaching from Pema Chodron, which is to sit like a mountain in the midst of a hurricane. Deborah, you are the descendant your ancestors deserved. Your daughter is the descendant that they deserved. Because the mountain in your family is empathy, isn't it? It's caring about the other. It's being a co-conspirator for systemic belonging. And That's so it rings true. And so it, to complete the advice, what is the mountain in your body? What is the mountain that defines you? Mine is to hold my heart open to hear the other person's story, even if it hurts me. Because that is the basis of empathy and compassion. What is your mountain? Because you were to sit like that mountain because the world will always be stormy, sometimes worse than other times. We're in a particularly bad time, but this too shall pass. Yes, indeed. And it has always been part of me to bring people together, mm -hmm. to join together to make a difference, mm -hmm. to make the world a better place. Tukun alam. Yes, like to, to heal the world. Tikkun alam, that's me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Indeed, mm -hmm. and it's it's um, it it keeps me going mm -hmm. through all kinds of situations, and I cannot tell you, frankly. What a surprise it's been that I've been able to do all that I do. I'm just <laughs> me, <laughs> you know, but you're right. The mountain is there and that's what people need to think about and to articulate it, especially is wonderful. Yeah. Well, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. And not only to articulate it, but to write about it. Yes. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Yes. That's right. We have to, we, even if it means we get into good trouble, right? Oh, that's almost inevitable. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I've written 18 books. Two of them are memoirs. And I can trace back getting into good trouble back to being a toddler. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Sometimes it's just part of the mountain. That's right. That's right. Oh, my goodness. Well, is there anything else you would like to add that we haven't talked about? Well, I would invite people to visit reunion.reboot.io. There's all the sort of standard stuff that you'll see in a book website, you know, about where to buy the book and, you know, different podcast appearances and 
But most importantly, there's a subsection on there called uh, Reunion Stories of Belonging. And we've uh, completed a three episode podcast with a variety of people talking about their own journey. And there's a little nine minute documentary about my returning home to Brooklyn, which is where I first belonged. And there's an invitation for people to leave their own stories of belonging and to share that. So that's the best way, you know, you can follow me on all social media and all of that stuff. But more importantly, take some time, understand to whom and to where you belong so that you can lay the groundwork for others to know that they belong. I love it. Thank you so much. Um, this has been a great afternoon for me. I hope you've wow. enjoyed it too. <laughs> I've enjoyed it immensely. Thank well, you so much for hosting the, the uh, conversation. A pleasure. And thank you to all our audience for being part of this today. And uh, you can go on to the American Diversity Report, get the link to this to share and make comments. We look forward to hearing from you. Thanks again.